If you found that the earth was going to turn into some type of utopia, I'm telling you right now, don't trust it. When you understand prophecy, you understand that the kingdom of the beast is, is very different. Number one, the people traded gifts when God's word was no longer causing them guilt in the earth. They traded gifts. Where they get the gifts from? What do you mean they traded gifts? And they didn't like the Christians. Christians are full of morals and everything else. So I ask you this, what happened to the church from this moment we live in right now, this very day, to that time where, where a large amount of people no longer liked the church? They hated the church. They hated God. Right? What happened? That's underway right now. It's something we ought to look at in prophecy because the end may seem a little different than what most folks suspected. Even after calamities come, there's going to be a rebuild. And during that rebuild, that's when everything is going to be solid. It will have changed. There are some surprises you guys are going to see. And uh, some different ways of life people will run to during a specific time. But right now, before all that comes uh, to fruition, all of it, there's going to be a transition of government, transition of life, a transition of people. You're still going to have your money, by the way. But I'll tell you this right now. In the new world, I'm going to call it, if you're not a citizen, you will not have citizens' rights. If you're not a citizen of this new world, you won't have citizens' rights. You won't be able to drive. You won't be able to get a bank account. You won't be able to rent or buy from anybody. You won't be able to sell. You won't be in the financial system. You will not be a citizen. And there will be places set up for people who are non-citizens. China has them right now. People are stuck in re-education camps right now. And they want these people to act and do and believe in certain ways. And if you saw the methods they employ in these re-education camps, you realize half the people never get out again. Anybody who speaks out against uh, China, they're re-educated so that they support China. The problem is most of the people never get out. They have millions of people in these re-education camps right now. There's no hope of them getting out. Your life is over once you enter into one of those uh, uh, places. And it, money doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how influential you are. It does not matter how much money you have. You're going to get thrown into one of those places. If you're not tied to influential blood, you're done for. In other words, they go back to the roots of China itself. And if you're not tied by blood to some of these um, high status individuals, you can forget it. You have no chance. There are billionaires right now who are running away from China, but they can't run too far. China has a large reach. China has gotten people over here in the U.S. and Europe and overseas, and it doesn't matter where they go, they can get them if they go against China's uh, way or you get mixed up politically with China, it's a very dangerous uh, spot to be in. They can smile all day, but they are the worst of vultures, right? They are bad. Personally, I wouldn't have none of those people would ever enter step foot to the U.S. They wouldn't. Not like that because they're ruthless. They are truly ruthless no matter how much they smile. That's the true nature of them. They will behead you quicker than anybody would in the Middle East. You haven't seen how ruthless people can be until you have seen what China does to its own people every day, all day. These protests and things that you saw on television, did you know that half of that was staged to make the world believe that somehow they were running uh, some free society or something like that? They have militarized the children. Most of the kids right now are indoctrinated into a type of uh, mindset with China. They're also extremely militant. They're also extremely smart and disciplined children. So in our case, if you do a comparison, a 13-year-old in China has the mentality of a 27-year-old soldier in the U.S. Think of it that way. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to deal with that also. So all these things we're going to deal with, and those who have been sitting prideful are going to cry soon enough. Those of you who remain humble, teachable, you have your eyes open. You're not one of these people who are standing up doing everything Jesus said don't do. You're going to need that supernatural protection and mercy. You will most certainly need it. Because uh, somehow, if you guys can't see it by now, I don't know how you're going to see it. But in this country, we're messing up as a whole. We're messing up. It's very dangerous what's going on right now. Of all times in America, of all times in Europe, of all times for the allied forces of the West, we should be on one accord and we should allow no one to sow any discord between us. But as with the families, so are the countries. 
Even in families in the U.S. and Europe and overseas, you have a lot of confusion. Most of you have been noticing that your families are breaking up and it's almost like nothing can stop the breakup. Is everybody's running in their own direction? They have different ideologies. Doesn't matter if you, you know, get together for Thanksgiving or Christmas, you separate. Most people don't even talk to each other. They have little cliques in their families. Division is everywhere. The countries are the same way, and that's going to cost us. The lines of communication have broken down. When they hang up the phone, everybody is talking trash about the other country, even when they're allied, and that's a big mistake. That spirit has been released among uh, us, among everybody, and it's working. Whatever it can work, and it's doing exactly what was prophesied to be done and it looks like nobody can stop it somebody says divided we fall well the bible jesus actually said a house divided against itself shall not stand that's a decree whenever christ or the father says shall that's a decree so it's not a condition it's a decree it means it will happen that's what it means. A condition is, well, maybe, you know, house divided against itself, it might fall apart. That's a condition. A decree is when that word shall comes in. Let there be light. That word be, let there be light, that's a decree. There shall, there shall be this and that. Those are decrees. So that's going to be the result, exactly as Jesus named it. This we must make ourselves ready for. Because many of you, you'll constitute the last line of defense of morals, Christianity, and everything else. Those of you who are even left over after that, you're going to have to face the world in a very different way. It's going to have to be Christians that will never back away from their morality and the ways of Christ they hold tight. Uh, if they go out there on their own or they feel they have to be violent, well, mercy is going to be lifted from them. Because in those days, the Bible says in Revelation, listen up, basically, that those who have ears he hear. But those who lead into captivity will themselves go into captivity, and those who kill with the sword will be killed with the sword. So in those days, whatever you sow, you're going to reap almost instantly. As we continue to go forward and forward and forward, it seems like mercy has dissipated all the way. And whatever a person sows, they're going to reap it almost before they can sow it. And those are the days we face. It will be an absolute different way of life and everybody is not built for that way of life for those of you who will be here the lord has prepared you to live in that world he has prepared you to live beyond what you see today but i'll say it again it likely will not be what we think it will be it's going to be exactly what god named it to be and we would do well to follow whatever he reveals to us so that we know but to try and predict what will come i'm starting to see that more and more as a huge mistake of people because they did the same thing with Christ as we are reading into the Gospels. The ones who were supposed to be wise about the Word of God couldn't even recognize the Son of God. How can you partake of the Spirit of the living God and not know who His Son is? And His Son is the Word of God made flesh. So they did not know the Word of God. And they were supposed to be the experts. These were people who knew academically all things about the law. But they were spiritually dead. And unfortunately, all too often, that's what happens. And, and do me a favor, never give placement to pride. Pride says, I already know it. Pride says, I have it right. The humble don't say things like that. See, if I have something right, somebody else is stating something wrong, then you have to think about why are they stating it wrong? Because they think they're right. And so long as a person thinks they're right, they will not believe you. With any correction you give them, you're going to provoke them. That's what the proverb states. It also says you cannot argue with a fool. And if you argue with somebody who thinks they're right in their own mind, you're going to lose, as what Proverbs says. So don't argue with those who think they're right. But the humble, the true wise, they are slow to speak and quick to listen. The ones who know it all, those folks, you, you're not going to change anything they believe. And they have to see it themselves. Those are the folks who go through life and they say, well, I thought it would be different. That's what they say. The humble do not say that. They almost simply say, thank you, Lord, because they're not trying to cause God to walk in a certain pathway. They get at the end. They don't sit up there and say, well, I can't believe this happened. They never say that. The humble are very different. They wait for the revealing of the living God, their day-to-day -day situations. They're not trying to outpace it because they're not trying to be seen. They're not trying to be out there and get out there in front. That's not what they're here for. They're trying to be pleasing unto the Lord. They let him handle the big things. Listen close. Fear is something that all of us have. God did not give us the spirit of fear. He didn't. Nevertheless, we have fears anyway. But they're also good 
Now, because God did not give us the spirit of fear, then we can be glad of that one, right? That this is, is not from above. And if it's not from above, it can only come from one other source, which, by the way, is good to identify what spirit comes from where. So when we are questionable about the future of this world, where it's going and everything else, enough that it causes us fear, it's a good gauge in our lives, something that there's no trickery involved. It's very, very real. Now, having fear means you're looking at the world, and most of us have been touched by the world in a not so good way. Most of us have been injured by the world. Most of us have been threatened to a degree by the world, you know, by things in the world. Most of us have. Because of that, we know that the world does not really, even, even in the good situations, you know you have to compromise quite a few things, that your life be trouble-free in this world. And, and for the most part, there's no such thing. So it's very dangerous pathway this world takes, and it can cause fear. It's a good thing in this way. See, we always need a gauge to see where we are. If we take an honest look at ourselves, we can look and look and look and think and come up with wrong estimates. We can come up with the wrong thing every time. It's almost like you saying, well, I'm not afraid of so-and-so. But then when you are in that situation, it's very different. You may have been convinced you wouldn't be afraid of it. But when it happened, you saw the truth of it. And you said, ooh, okay. And in fact, that's part of growing up. When you grow, you learn things about yourself you didn't know before. Some of you, you thought you did not have a capacity to say certain things you have said or do certain things you have done. You didn't believe it. Until you did it, you did not believe that you would ever fall prey to it. Many people thought they would never. I knew a person who said, oh, I hate people who are addicted. They just ought to get off the stuff and just, you know, suffer through it and leave it alone. They just have no willpower. The same individual was cautioned about his mouth, but he kept speaking. And then two years later, he was addicted to pain pills. How? Car accident. So it's not like he went out there and purposely got on pain pills. A car accident caused him a lot of excruciating pain in his lower back and other parts, and he was taking pain medication to alleviate it. But when it came time for him to get off the pain medication, he found that he had a physical addiction. And to this very day, he understands what addiction is very well. So he never thought he would be addicted. So much so, he used to talk about those who were addicted, saying that they were weak. He no longer says that. He truly understands now. So we always get into a position where we think we will not become this or that, or we think we can withstand this or that. But life often will prove us wrong. But it's good because we learn the reality of ourselves. And when you find out where you are, when you honestly find out where you are, you don't really like it. But you can always do something about it. That person who got addicted, now he knows how tough that struggle is. Now he can pray correctly, truthfully, and soberly about that condition and have mercy upon those who are trapped or held by that condition. He didn't know that before. He does now. He could have only known that by being addicted. He couldn't have known that as an outsider. Fear of the world, these situations, is very similar because we say we believe in the Lord and all the things he provides. The truth is, not many people right now have all the experience required or necessary to actually not be afraid of the world. All the people do not have the experience with God's deliverance yet. They just simply don't. And when you don't have experience with God's full deliverance, here's what happens. You may look at a scary situation in the world and it will scare you because you think you might have to go through it. And it's an uncertainty factor that you begin to think about. Is this going to cost me this? Will I really have to endure this? Can I even take that? You know, it hurt last time when I was in a situation. And you start remembering all these things and the potentials of what could be. So the truth is, in that moment, you're not believing in God's deliverance for you, but you are believing in the world. And so that's where the good gauge comes in. Because if you believe in the world, naturally you're going to be afraid. But when we fully believe in the Lord, we can no longer be afraid. Does that make sense? That's when you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil because you know he's with you. But you have to have that experience with deliverance. You have to know that God is with you. And the only way you can know that is by your position in him. So he told us through his apostles to do something. It's very simple. You ready? 
doing everything you can do to stand, stand there for. Now, let me share this uh, small thought with you guys. I can only speak about me. I can't speak about you, but I can speak about my own errors, faults, you know, falls and all that stuff. There was a time when I was uh, quite confident in my own skill set, my own resolve, task of mind, everything else. So I stepped out the first time as a newbie in combat and I resorted to my training, of course. And when the situation got very scary, I started to freeze. I froze because I, there's no way you can anticipate what you're going to do in any given situation unless you have been in that situation. And so dealing with that uncertainty in that situation, I just simply froze. I couldn't say anything. I was so weak. I couldn't pull the trigger. Nothing was working right. The trigger felt like it was, you know, a thousand pounds. That was a full body freeze. That's real fear. That's what happened. I didn't know my body would do that. I was so confident in the training. I was so confident and because I aced everything getting up to that point, I didn't think that was possible. I thought it was just, you know, it was going to be like training. You just go through there and what have you. So I was naive, having no experience. The next time I'm going to combat, it was very different because from that day forward, I stopped deluding myself. I didn't have these thoughts of Ramboism going into combat anymore. I realized that it's up to the Lord if I live or die. So that was the first fear I had to get rid of, living or dying. Now, I had to do that with the Word. I couldn't do that with anything else. So with the Word, I researched, studied, prayed about it, and found out that my life, living or dying, is in the Lord's hands. All I can do is what I know how to do, and He understands that. I'll say it again. All you can do is what you know how to do, and your Father in Heaven understands that. So that's all I could do. So I said, Lord, all I can do is what I know how to do. That's it. I can't do anything else. You have life or death in your hands. And sure enough, when I went into combat with that thought in my head, I no longer thought about life or death, which gave me confidence in quite a few areas. But the fear was still there. The uncertainty factor was still there, but it didn't freeze. And piece by piece, as I no longer deluded myself in several areas of my life, fear was leaving until one day I left all together. It just left all together. I'd been through the pain level part. I knew what the outcome could be. I saw some people in bad condition. I said, I could be one of those, but for the sake of the country, I need to fight for a good cause. Not just jump out there and kill the enemy, but fight for a cause. And so from that, you know, from those days forward, everything I went to endeavor to do had a cause behind it that had nothing to do with me. Somebody says, what about torture? Well, I went through that too. But again, I'll say it again. Everything I did, I did, and it had nothing to do with me. See, I can never make anything about me. I no longer sought self-deliverance from myself. I didn't do things to deliver myself. I didn't do things to promote myself. I did things so that other folks could enjoy life. I did things so that other people could be free. And come to find out, that's where my strength was. And come to find out by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's our mandate. To be used as a vessel in this world for the sake of somebody else. And so there's a time when we have to look at ourselves and say, wait a minute, who am I living for here? Am I living for just for me? Or am I living as a vessel for somebody else in this world? Who am I believing? Am I believing the world or am I believing Christ? Ultimately, I found out I was not believing Christ. And when I began to believe Christ, all the fear of the world left. Because it comes down to what can the world do to me that Christ is not aware of. And so my stance in him became very important. And those are the times when I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And I didn't fear any evil. But I walked in the valley of the shadow of death with great concern of those who could have been stuck there. You'd be shocked. Fear leaves when you actually believe in your father's word. Fear comes back when you believe in what the world says. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. At what time did God tell you anything fearful? What, what, if somebody named something God told them that caused them massive fears, just so fearful, full of uncertainty, you couldn't take another step. The truth is, he did not. He told you a story of how he loves, how he delivers, how he will judge. There's no fear in that. It's up to us. We have believed many things in the world. We believe the world has power over us in a lot of aspects, and we're wrong about that. The world has no power over us, lest it be granted to them by the Father, in which case it is for our deliverance. See how that works. The more we believe our Father, the less fear we're going to have. But we have to face reality, not reality of what you see, the reality of our stance in Christ. Now, doing everything, if you do everything you can possibly do. I'm telling you right now, when you do everything you can possibly do, here's the attitude you're going to have. You're going to say, Lord, I did everything humanly possible. So right now I'm standing on your word and whatever happens, it's all in your hands. I know for a fact 
I did everything I know how to do. And listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, that's all you can do. When you do everything you can do to stand, to go forward in Christ, when you do everything, not leaving anything to chance, when you do everything you know how to do to stand, you're going to have a strength you never thought possible. You're going to have determination you didn't think was there. You're going to have resolve that your brain did not conjure. But the Lord will, listen, at that moment, you're standing in Christ and no one can knock the Savior down. But you have to do everything you know how to do that you've been given to do, right? Not what you don't know how to do. Everything God gave you, utilize it. And once you do that, your conscience is clear. I don't know anybody who can stand up without wavering when their conscience is not clear. If something is on your mind, there's something you could have done, it's going to weaken your stance. When you put aside something you could have handled, it's going to weaken your stance. When you do everything you can possibly do, you will boldly say, Lord, the ball is in your court. I have done what was required of me to the best of my ability. And when you say that with all of what you are, Having done all of what you could do, you're going to notice a strength you never thought possible. But you'll never know that strength until you exhaust everything you know how to do in every situation. Not one or two, every situation. And don't think for a minute it's some exhausting task. But the Lord requires you to do what you know how to do. He does not require you to do what you don't know how to do. And I'll tell you right now, for this day, he constantly states he has given us enough. His grace is sufficient for today, for this hour. So that means the truth is, are we doing everything we can do in every day that we live? You know what the honest answer is? Probably not, because we don't investigate that way. We've been distracted. When you're distracted, you can't do everything you know how to do because you're distracted. Refocus, begin to exhaust what the Lord has given you wisdom and knowledge to do and take your mind out of those things you don't know how to do and learn to utilize the inventory he's already given you. Utilize it. Utilize it for the kingdom. Do everything you can possibly do. And then, and only then, will you be granted that perfected strength of Christ in you. That's when the scripture comes true. In our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Not when we are weak, he is strong. No, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. How so? Because we're not in the way anymore. We're not trying to fulfill his role in our lives. That's why his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Because in our weakness, we can't do anything else. Isn't that correct? And if we're honest, we don't know how to do everything. We don't. But if you're trying to do everything that he has not given you to do, of course you're going to mess it up. The Lord didn't put a heavy burden on us, but to utilize those things he's given us. And I assure you, in those things he has not, he will perform. He most certainly will perform. The key again is, having done all you can do to stand, stand therefore. It didn't say run around from left to right. That's not what it said. It said stand. Once you complete what you can honestly complete, then you have done all of what you can do. You've also been obedient. And all those who are obedient have a promise hovering over them. Should you come in full compliance with obedience by Christ, you have a promise hovering over you upon completion or remaining in that obedience. And it will never fail. All too often, we don't stay in that area. We don't reach that point. Unless we focus on it, we can't be fully obedient. Think about it. Because we get distracted. And we start trying to do things we have no knowledge of. That's how people get themselves into big trouble. And folks, just to go back to the original uh, statement here. When the world can cause you to have fear, it's because you're believing in the world more than you believing in the living God. Because I found that I can't believe in the world and believe in God at the same time. I can't do it. I can only believe in one or the other. I cannot believe in both. I don't know if you noticed, but the world's decrees are failing. For some reason, everything they said they could do has failed. What they said would come about did not. All the forecasts of the experts have failed. They have been wrong, 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 wrong. Not only wrong, it blew up in their face. And what they said would never come has arrived. And what they said can never take place is taking place right now. Why? Because you're dealing with men. Men who attempt and try things. They don't know the fruit of what they're trying. They try things in desperatism. Trying to make things come about. Being convinced 
by their own calculations that it's going to come out just like the computer printed it and it's not working. Some of the problems that are coming they couldn't foresee. It's just not working out very well. A lot of it through self-sabotage. Whatever the case is, it's not working out. But there's not one time that the Lord's word ever failed. We just fail to keep his word. And we know that's the truth. For everything Jesus did, it angers darkness. Why? Because brokenness is real estate for darkness. Brokenness wants company to be broken. Jesus came to heal, to undo that brokenness, to take the real estate back. And every time he did something, they got angry. Verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they would always get these little groups. And when a breakthrough began to happen, when people were delivered and freed, they would get together in their groups and come up with a lawful reason, a justifiable reason within the law to, to persecute him, to certainly talk about him. Do you know this same spirit is in operation? It never stopped. It's all throughout the earth today. If somebody says something profound and people go, ah, oh, I never heard that before, instantly you'll have people highly offended because they want people to believe everything they're saying. What they'll do is get together in clicks and say, well, this person is just wrong. Here's what the Bible says. Ba -da -da, not what he said, right? That's what they do. They spend most of their time trying to prove how somebody is wrong. God never assigned any apostle, any prophet, anybody to do anything like that. And it's amazing to me how you don't see the apostles going up to people saying, well, you're wrong and we're going to get together and show you how wrong you are. You don't see the prophets who got together and did the same thing. They never did that. But the Pharisees and the scribes and the doctors of the law did. Those who thought they really knew everything by their carnal minds were angered every time a breakthrough happened for somebody else. Satan is deeply aggravated when somebody has a breakthrough. That's when his attacks begin. That's why he does not like the gospel. Because every time you start reading the gospel, somebody is set free from bondage with these, let's call them lawgivers, press around somebody's neck. Your flesh loves rule. Your mind loves rules for two reasons. One, so that you can use those rules to exercise dominion over another. Number two, so that you can mischievously go around those rules when somebody else cannot. So that's all based in pride, mischief, and manipulation. Listen to me closely. There is a darkness in this world, and it is part of something so common, but it cannot be seen by human flesh. It can only be seen by the spiritual mind. All it wants is for people to confess their sins. Now hear me out. That sounds like it will be okay, right? Wrong. They want you, once you're free from sin, to confess that you were a sinner. But they want you to do it in everything they point out. This is what they want you to do. They already know it. They just want you to do it because every time you do it, it will cause you to feel like you're in bondage to sin again or make you feel worthless. They know what they're doing. When you repent to Jesus, you don't have to answer to any man. You are free by Christ and Christ alone. If anybody wants you to confess your sins, if you're going to do it for a testimony, fine. But there are people out there that every day they want you to disqualify yourself. And certainly, if you say you have a calling from the Lord, they want to see the paperwork. I'm telling you the truth. If any of you said, well, I have a calling from the Lord, they'll say, well, I can't find it. I can't find it on Google, so it must not exist. I mean, let me say something to you. Jesus said whom he called, he qualified. Those qualifications are not written down. In, in some institution somewhere. That's why the Lord said, blessed are the poor. He didn't say that about anybody else, did he? Because there's something happening with the poor the rich can never have. And hardly anybody else can barely perceive lest they be put in that same position. Let me continue here. Just understand about these spirits that are out there and they challenge you. Listen, you don't have to enter into conversation with these things. These spirits are always in operation. And guess where you find them? You find them among any gathering. They're going to be among you, which means, now listen to me carefully, any one of you at a moment of weakness, that spirit will work through. Do you hear that? It does not designate itself to any one person. Any one of you in a moment of weakness, and it will work through you. It most certainly will cause you to question somebody else's Christianity. If Jesus is the one who is responsible for the fruit of your life, then he's the one you answer to concerning the fruit of your life. He gave his saints spiritual eyes to see all fruit. 
but he also told his saints not to judge. Leave that to the living God. We may see the fruit of someone, but remember, we're here to spread the gospel. Why do you think we live or grew up here on earth so that we would understand how difficult it is? I used to know people who would go up to a person and say, they would say, I hate liars. That's what they would say. They would say, I hate liars. Now, making that statement means you're no longer a liar. But I asked this person, I said, oh, you hate liars? Have you ever told somebody you weren't there or implied that you weren't there on the phone when the phone rang, you didn't want to answer, so you walked by it? You ever not want to talk to somebody and then wake up later and they say, well, how come you didn't text me back? You say, oh, I must have been out doing something, but you weren't. You saw their text and did something else. So the truth is, we're daily liars. People are daily liars. They really are. Whether they be small or big, we're daily liars. To hate a liar, most people say that because somebody told the lie on them and it cost them something. People have lied, presidents have lied, people have, smart people have, professors have lied, just about everybody lies at one point in time to protect themselves from something else. They tell little bitty ones to get people off their back. Hey, did you see my picture I sent you? Oh yeah, no you didn't see it. You didn't see it, but you lie about it. Just so the person will go about their business. People lie to small children all the time, don't they? They do lie. They'll say, well when are we gonna, oh I've already got that plan, but the truth is they don't have it planned. People lie all the time. Here's the problem. The problem is, once we understand that without Christ, we are sinners. And with Christ, we are washed from our sins. That's what makes us holy. Not us within ourselves, but us being washed by the blood. Us sinful people being washed by the blood. Which means, yes, we did commit the act, but God forgave the act. God washed away the sentence for that act. He took our place in punishment for whatever we did. Once we stay mindful of that, then a person who's lying, you'll understand why they're lying. Now, wouldn't that be more usable? If you heard a person lie, would you just say, I hate a person who lies? But what if you could tell why the person lied? People lie to protect themselves. People lie to survive. People lie because they're caught in things they see no way out of. And when another brother or sister in Christ realizes what they were and they don't condemn the person for doing it because a person already knows it's wrong, God said so. When a person comes up and says, hey, you don't have to do that anymore. I totally understand why you did it, but you don't have to do that anymore. That's the very reason Christ came, so we don't have to do those things anymore. We can survive through him now. We don't have to duck and dodge things in the world anymore. See, that brings people to Christ when we're honest. But if we take a stance like Caesar, like we've never done any wrong in our lives, because the same person that says, I hate a liar, can they actually say that they have they hate adultery? Can they say they've never entered into adultery? Can they say they've never fornicated? Can they say they never lusted after the opposite sex or the same sex? Can they actually say that? Probably not. So if they can't say that, then why would they nitpick over one saying, I hate a liar, but what, you love an adulteress? To break one commandment means you're guilty of breaking them all. See, we've got to get ourselves back into this place of truth, of self-recognition between us and Christ and see the distance we have alone. And only by the blood can we dwell with the Lord again and the Father again, not by ourselves, not by our own deeds. We have messed up so much there's no correction to what we did. If we didn't have the blood of the Lamb, there is no home for us. There's only damnation for us, and we all know it. So if we go to a person and see them in the same footsteps that we walked years ago, wouldn't that make you want to help that person, not judge the person, not cast the person out? But give the person an opportunity. Maybe that's the day they'll say yes. Maybe it isn't. But either way, we're to carry a message. You can only carry that message if you actually know the message. If Christ means something to you, you're going to have that message in you. When you realize that you were a scoundrel, when you realize you were a public disgrace, but with Christ you're clean, but he's the only soap anybody can ever have. That's when you realize you were dirty. And that person you're about to accuse, they're just dirty. Where's the opportunity? You see, at this stage in the game, folks, we what we cannot do, I'm going to say this dream one more time. I had it bothered me so bad to this very day. I dreamt of a church. I walk up to the church through a bunch of wounded. I get to the church and two guys are standing at the door and they're wearing black. They open the door and inside the church, everybody's wearing the same thing. They look real nice, neat and everything. The pastor is preaching and I look out at the wounded and I say, hey, let's let them in here. No, they're not wearing the right garments. 
because they were wounded, because they had white bandages, because they did not look like those inside. The church left the wounded outside. They have it backward. The church is not for those who look all, they're, they're just good, dressed, fully conformed in their own minds, those who reject the wounded. No, the church are the receptionists for the wounded. Because if the church is not operating in the earth, there's no gospel in the earth. That's what the church has, the good news. But how can they give the good news if every Sunday they just give it to each other? Where then are the wounded? The wounded are outside the church, dying. In that, that dream just, it was sad because they looked at the people and they were laughing at the wounded. They were pushing the wounded away. You can't come in here, you're wounded. Go change yourself and then come back, we'll let you in. The church is not a club. It's supposed to be the body of the one who was broken for us. His body was broken for us. Why do you think the church consists of the broken? And what did Jesus say? They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Somehow the world turned that around and is quickly turning into entertainment, a pep rally, whatever the case is. But the wounded are outside. You know who the wounded are? The wounded are the ones who are still drinking. The wounded are the ones who are still doing the devil's bidding. Those are the ones who are in bondage. But you know what they say these days? You can't go to the church. They won't accept you unless you're like them. And if you do anything wrong around any of them, they'll point fingers at you. They'll crucify you. How in the world did we get to that place? You know what that comes from? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but that comes from people consistently and continually saying, oh, I'm just so tired. I don't want to fool with any of the broken anymore. I don't want to fool with anybody anymore. Oh, I just want to give up and go home. That's what it comes from. No soldiers, just a bunch of tired people who are ready to give up on everybody else so long as they're safe or they think they're safe. But I can tell you this, how would the Lord look at me if I was willing to turn my back on the very ones he cleaned me up to go give a message to. Where's that message at? Didn't he clean us up to give a message to those who were dirty and filthy, not to point fingers, not to make them a headline? What has happened? If it doesn't change, everybody's going to be in for a shock. When I see a wounded person, it's actually a reflection of who I used to be. No matter how bad people think they are, it's sim they're simply a reflection of who I used to be. The wounded are us. That's who they are, different stages in our lives. But the Lord saw fit to bring us to a point of understanding where we would accept him. But it took somebody with persistence who had the gospel with persistence in order for us to continually hear that calling. The Bible says, how can they hear less one be sent? Somebody was on television for us, somebody was in church for us, and they spoke a specific thing which stayed with us. These were men and women of God who stayed the course. And we heard that message. We can deny it all day, but we heard that message. And it may not have taken effect the same hour, but it took effect. And somebody prayed over us. And here we are. And I can't help but to see that process and how it must never be interrupted for those who are still in darkness. That's what things like this are for. So no one is shoved out. Again, Jesus spoke to those who would hear him, those who did not hear him. He made it clear. He was speaking to those who had ears to hear. Remember something. It is the Father above who will open the ears of an individual to allow them to hear what you have to say when you're sent. The Lord will prepare the vessels you are to go to. He'll do it every single time. If God put upon you something to teach or something to talk about, trust me when I tell you that the Lord has prepared vessels of reception for whatever you have to get. All too often in this world, people are offended for those who won't listen. And I'm telling you, for those who won't listen, that's on them. Speak to those who have been conditioned to hear from you. It's just like a blessing. People often say, I wonder why God won't bless me right away. Because he has to prepare you to receive one of his blessings. You have to be prepped to receive one of his blessings. Just like when he puts two people together. They're going to have to be raised in a certain aspect, in a certain way. He will prepare two people to put them together. God prepares everything. We should know this by now. So, when you have a lot of you have complained, well, my family won't listen. They heard, they already heard you. A time will come. And they're going to try and find you because you were not talking the status quo, what everybody else was talking. They're going to come find you when things go totally haywire, when things are very dark, when hope is dim. They're going to come find you because 
People who stay the course within tradition and they fear men will never state what the Lord has placed upon their hearts. They will always water down what the Lord has given them. And that time will come when things that were never thought possible will happen right before people's faces. And people, I'm telling you now, they're going to be angry at their own pastors. They're going to be angry at their own teachers. They're going to say, you never, nobody ever said this. They didn't teach this stuff. See, they laugh about it now. They shun it now. They tell people to, you know, take that weird stuff somewhere else. When it starts to happen, that's when they call. You know, when they were disclosing this UFO stuff, right? And people found out the Navy had footage. And indeed, the Navy uh, um, uh, pilots were chasing these things. There were a lot of people then that went back to those they thought were crazy. And they said, hey, what did you say about so-and-so? What did you say about so-and-so? They do it all the time. Well, what's well, about to manifest? That being spiritual. By no means is it going to be conventional. For all those who conventionalized the end times, no one's going to want to hear a word they have to say. They're going to want the ones who are not afraid to speak what the Lord laid upon their hearts. That's why it's so important, no matter how much you're shunned, to say what the Lord has put in you. Don't change it in any way. Don't, don't change it. Because, you know, that often just messes up the whole message. 